Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Sophia Imperioli. I am one of the museum associates at the Louisville Historical Museum. Um, and I had the pleasure of writing the last article for the newsletter, The Historian, on the topic of enemy aliens and their treatment during World War II in the United States in general, in Colorado, and Louisville. So that is mainly the topic of what we're going to talk about tonight. In the meantime, if you haven't already, can you please just double check that your cell phones are silenced? I'm getting recorded, and I just don't want to ring down in the background. Um, and then if you could please hold your questions until the end, I'm happy to answer them. But once I get going on a track and then it gets interrupted, I don't mind the questions, but it'll be hard for me to get back on. So thank you very, very much. So let's get started. Um, one quick note as we go into this talk, I just want to clarify a few terms. So there are a few different ways that um, Americans refer to the incarceration, the internment, and the concentration camps of Japanese Americans during World War II. Each of those words has a very specific definition. When I use the word internment tonight, I'm going to be referring to those people who were intentionally held for the purpose of exchanging with potential prisoners in enemy countries abroad. So I don't mean the regular blanket term of internment, which means Japanese American internment. I'm going to use the term Japanese American incarceration for this talk, okay? That's another term that is used. And then believe it or not, during World War II, Japanese American incarceration camps were referred to as concentration camps. That was because at the time, many leaders didn't understand what was going on in Nazi Germany and the surrounding countries with their concentration camps. And now today, the term concentration camp has a whole slew of connotations with it, which is why we stray away from that word. However, a lot of scholars still prefer to use concentration camps because by definition, Japanese American incarceration was, was concentration camps. So, on this handy dandy sheet, which I will refer to at least once more in this presentation, I put a couple of links that explain different people's reasoning for using the different terms, so I encourage you to explore those on your own. Now, enemy aliens versus POWs, I just want to make a quick differentiation between the two. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about enemy aliens. We're all familiar with the concept of aliens, as in foreigners, but enemy aliens are foreign born people who are. Residents in the United States, but they are originally from those enemy countries that we are at war with. So during World War II, enemy aliens refers to Italians, Germans, and Japanese who are not yet citizens of the United States of America, but they live here. And then that is not to be confused with prisoners of war. Prisoners of war were present in Colorado during World War II. They were in POW camps, but they were originally from their country. They fought in their country. They were captured and they were brought here to be jailed until the war was over. And then I included this handy dandy little picture of the Great Western Hotel in Longmont because um, people talk about it sometimes as being a camp. That was a POW camp right in Longmont, very close to us. So if you get to look in, there's, there were a ton of POW camps all around Colorado and we, we had one really close to us. It was actually turned into apartments so you can still see it today. So the purpose of this talk in general, why are we here? It's to compare the treatment of enemy aliens throughout the United States with what I think is a really unique situation in Louisville. There were people of Japanese, Italian, and German descent who were in Louisville who I believe through my research did not face the same discrimination to the same degree as people of those nationalities throughout the country. And we'll get into that shortly. So a little bit of background on where the term enemy aliens comes from. The original definition of enemy aliens was, believe it or not, passed in American legislation in 1798. And if you're familiar with world events at the time, you'll know that the French Revolution was kicking off, and America believed that they were going to be going to war with France pretty soon. So they passed the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. And essentially, that gave the president the right to deport aliens, not during wartime, during peacetime, could just deport foreigners. And then during wartime, he could arrest, imprison, detain, and de deport. He had all these powers during wartime. The Sedition Act obviously limited speech, but that's not the focus of our talk today. In World War I is where enemy aliens really became a huge focus. It was constantly talked about every single day. Um, this was a portrayal of Germans in America, and this was a constant threat, this, this gorilla over your shoulder, a mad brute. So there was a lot of anti-German sentiment and, and a lot of anti-German um, enemy alien sentiment during World War I, and the U.S. actually incarcerated 6,300 German Americans during this time. Now, we have a few ties to this anti-German sentiment here in 
Louisville, believe it or not. There was actually a Germania house here in Louisville that was owned by an Aust Austrian immigrant, Joseph Lackner. Um, and the last recorded mention we have of his name, Germania House, is in 1916, which is the year that the U.S. entered World War I. And so I, I don't have exact evidence, but we can kind of infer that the name Germania had a few too many ties to Germany, and he probably changed the name to avoid that association. And then we have a few examples of family names that were most likely changed. It could have been simply they wanted to make it more Americanized, but it's interesting that they were German born and they changed their name to sound more American somewhat around this time. So the Steinbaugh, you had the Steinbaugh Pavilion right here. The name was actually originally spelled B-A-C, Steinbach, and they changed it to a more American sound or spelling. And then Mayhofer was originally spelled a little more German on the left. But again, this was a common tradition among immigrants, so it is completely likely that this had nothing to do with World War I, but I did want to say that people changed their names, and I use the example of Italian immigrants with the name Rossi. They changed their name to Ross just to sound a little more American. Now, why did people intern enemy aliens during World War I? Well, essentially, at the end of the day, yes, fear and racism, it, it's a means to gain political power, but essentially, if you incarcerate enemy aliens here in America, that means that the Germans that you've interned, the Japanese that you've interned, and the Italians that you've interned would ensure that your Americans abroad in those countries would be treated well. So it was kind of this mutually assured destruction kind of concept that if we intern people here, it will protect our people abroad. And they did it, like I said, to the tune of 6,300 people. I understand this is pretty hard to see, so I'll walk through it with you. Next time, I'll make the font bigger. <laughs> so this is just our road to war. We're starting here in 1933, and we go all the way up to May and June 1940, which is the year before World War II kicks off in America. So first, in 1933, Hitler and Franklin D. Roosevelt come to power in their respective countries. Japan leaves the League of Nations. This makes everybody very nervous. In March 1934, we have the passage of House Resolution 198, which creates the mccormick dickstein Committee, which is the forebearer to the House of Un-American Activities Committee. If you know what that is, we'll get into that in a second. And they were charged with basically investigating German activities, especially those with Nazi ties. Then in May 1934, J. Edgar Hoover's Bureau, which was just called the Bureau, it wasn't yet the FBI, begins investigating American Nazis as well. In 1936, Hoover creates a suspect list. This suspect list is integral to the events of Pearl Harbor and World War II. It's called the Custodial Detention Index. It has information on anybody with potential ties to their home countries of Germany, Italy, and Japan, anything that could potentially make them seem suspicious. So if you were corresponding with a family member at home, you were probably on that list. <laughs> um, and we'll talk about that more in a second. In 1936, the House Un-American Activities Committee is officially created. So that mccormick dickstein Committee is transformed into the HWAC, as I've decided to call it. <laughs> and uh, what do you call it? You may have heard of the House of Un-American Activities Committee if you studied McCarthyism and the Red Scare of the 1950s. Well, it actually had its start in 1936, and it was charged with investigating anybody who could potentially be disloyal to the United States, which included Nazis and communists. And then on September 1st, 1931, that is when World War II officially begins, when Hitler invades Poland. And then in May to June 1940, Franklin Delano Roosevelt addresses Congress, and he talks about the treacherous use of the fifth column. How many people have heard of the fifth column before? Oh, I am so excited. Okay. <laughs> he also makes several fireside chat mentions of the fifth column. So this was something that Americans were hearing about every single day, the fifth column, the fifth column. And I'll explain what that is very shortly. So essentially, the fifth column is a concept that came out of the Spanish Civil War in 1938. And what it is, is you have these pillars of society, justice, equality, liberty, and unity. But from within, you have a fifth column that is trying to undermine those other four columns. It's an insidious threat from within. And so Italians, Germans, and Japanese in America during World War II, or even before World War II, were looked at and assessed as to whether or not they were part of this fifth column. And then this is a regular poster you would have seen on a street corner. And I like to show it because it literally makes me feel paranoid. And I live in 2024. Now imagine that you are, th the whole world's at war. You're not yet in it. This is from 1940 and 1941. And you see this. It's terrifying to think like how paranoid people must have been looking to their neighbors who maybe didn't look like them. 
And then this is a, oh, I didn't do the disclaimer. I missed the disclaimer. I'm so sorry, everybody. I meant to say that this presentation will have racially insensitive images and words. I deeply apologize. I literally put that on the first slide and I missed it. I, it's completely integral to the story, so that's why I've chosen to include it. This is a um, newspaper comic that was created by Dr. Seuss, um, and it was run in newspapers across the country, and it shows Japanese Americans in California, Oregon, Washington, they're called the Honorable Fifth Column, there's that term again, and they're collecting TNT and quote unquote waiting for the signal from home. And this was completely acceptable, um, I wouldn't say literature, what we call this, just a depiction of regular everyday Japanese Americans during that time. Now, what, did, what were enemy aliens doing at home here in Louisville? So this is a picture of Joe Pacone right here. He was born in Italy in about 1911, and he was not a naturalized citizen by the time that World War II kicked off. And he was forced to register as an enemy alien during the Alien Registration Act of 1940. FDR signed that into law in, on June 28, 1940. Now what's interesting is this is a photo of Joe Pacone from 1928 in front of Louisville High School, the old Louisville High School. And I'll give you some names of who he's with and tell me if they all sound Italian to you. That's Joe Pacone, Wallace Andrew, Luverne Thompson, and Charles Zarini. I, see, I hear maybe one more Italian in there. Now this is 1928. This is a time of intense racist discrimination all over the US. But here in Louisville, we have this microcosm where people interact a little more freely than everywhere else. Now, Joe Pacone, as part of the Alien Registration Act of 1940, was forced to fill out one of these cards, get his photo taken, and carry it around with him every single place that he went because he was an enemy alien. Now, his son Bob Pacone shared with us later that his father felt like he kind of got off easy. He kind of blended in with everybody else. He looked like everybody in Louisville. He looked like a lot of people around the surrounding areas but he had a friend who was of Japanese ancestry who worked at a hospital in Denver and he felt horrible for him because his friend could not hide the way that he looked and his friend got terrible, terrible treatment during World War II. And that's a guilt that he carried with him for a very long time. Another story of the Alien Registration Act of 1940, this is Jack Miyasaki. He graduated from Louisville High School in 1943, but when Pearl Harbor happened, he was actually at a church service that next day, and he told us a story in a 1986 interview about how the sheriff had heard that Japanese people were congregating, and he was like, oh, that's no good. It was a church service. <laughs> so the sheriff got in there, busted down the doors, and forced everybody to disperse simply because they were Japanese and they were attending a service together. Now, Jack also tells us that um, because of the Alien Registration Act, he, he and his family were forced to forfeit their firearms, radios or shortwave radios, any explosives they might have had, cameras. These were things that the United States government felt were a threat for enemy, and any enemy alien to own, and so they had to literally turn it into a government agent. Now, Jack's family was lucky because he was born in America. So even though his family was not allowed to have these items during World War II, after the war, a lot of families who had American-born children were able to have those children gain that property back in their name. Their parents were still not allowed to own it, I think, until the early 50s. And the same goes for property, believe it or not. Some enemy aliens had their properties um, confiscated, and if their children were all born in Japan or, or Italy, or, they weren't able to get it back, and it was no longer theirs. And I have some really interesting stuff to show you on that towards the end of the presentation. Now, America's entry into World War II, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. Do you remember those custodial detention index lists I told you about? Well, the FBI had been working on those since the 1930s. On December 8th, I have some numbers. On December, I lied, December 9th, 1941, the FBI had arrested 620 Germans, 98 Italians, and 1,212 Japanese into custody. A month later, that total rose to 2,559 total enemy aliens in jail. These were people with political ties to homeland organizations who had not done nothing more maybe than keep in touch. I will not say that there were maybe some Nazi elements in there. There might have been, but for the most part, these were average everyday Americans who kept in touch with their roots. Okay. Now, executive or, oh, let me talk about the presidential proclamations. So, presidential proclamation 25, 25, 26, 25, 26, and 25, 27 allowed the United States government to detain any enemy aliens without proper cause, simply because of suspicion of disloyalty. 
and it was the exact wording is being of the age of 14 years and upward who shall be within the United States and not actually naturalized shall be liable to be apprehended, restrained, secured, and removed as enemy aliens. Next comes Executive Order 9066, which if you attended the past talk or you've studied on your own, you would know that is the order that President Franklin Roosevelt signed, which essentially incarcerated Japanese Americans during the war from the West Coast. It created a military exclusion zone, which I have a map on the next slide, and it affected 112,000 Japanese Americans, and it also affected 10,000 to 20,000 German and Italian Americans. So this is the map of the military exclusion zone. Anything you see in blue, the United States government considered to be um, militarily significant and to allow enemy aliens to stay in that area, according to them, was a significant threat to national security. And so they forced the relocation of Japanese Americans and the, those few Italian and German Americans inward to relocation centers. Grenada, right there, is our, our own um, relocation center, incarceration camp in uh, Colorado. There's some materials back there if you'd like to take those that talk about Camp Amachi, but I'm not going to talk too much about it this time. I'm just talking about the treatment of enemy aliens. So this is a great slide for me because I have, it's, it's hilarious how history plays out. So on the West Coast, we have General John L. DeWitt, who is in charge of the exclusion areas, the military exclusion areas. And on the East Coast, we have Lieutenant General Hugh Drum. Well, Lieutenant General, or sorry, General John DeWitt designated the area of exclusion and he, want, he caused all of the Japanese Americans to be removed. He also imposed restrictions on all the Italian Americans who stayed um, and he forced some Italian Americans from San Diego and the San Francisco areas to be forcibly removed as well. Um, he was responsible for the, the confiscation of thousands of Italian fishermen's boats because they feared that Italian fishermen would row out and try to spy on military areas, which completely crippled their economic um, foothold in the area. Now, I wanted to read for you John L. DeWitt's exact words about what he had to say when he was assessing the threat of the Japanese race. The Japanese race is an enemy race, and while many second and third generation Japanese born in the United States are possessed of American citizenship and become, quote unquote, Americanized, the racial strains are undiluted. The very fact that no sabotage has taken place to date is a disturbing and confirming indication that such action will be taken in the future. <laughs> Nothing happened and therefore it will happen. That is great logic in my book. Oh, wait, it gets better. So, Lieutenant General Hugh Drum was in charge of the East Coast. They had kind of drawn out um, military exclusion areas on the East Coast, um, but he actually advised General John DeWitt against the forced removal of more Italian Americans from the West Coast. And can anybody guess why? Uh, you're not gonna guess why. Because on the East Coast, he could not do the same thing. It was logistically impossible for him to remove Italian and German Americans from the East Coast. And I, I gave you some numbers of the composition of just Manhattan, New York City. Out of seven million residents in New York City, five million of those were immigrants and hundreds of thousands of those were Italian and German born enemy aliens, quote unquote. He, so he, John DeWitt says, we gotta get him out of here. And Lieutenant General Hugh Drum says, ain't no way it's gonna happen. And that's why there wasn't another military exclusion zone on the East Coast, simply because of logistics. So then it kind of makes you wonder, was the designation of enemy alien truly a necessity? Now on the home front, home front here in Louisville and Colorado, out of all of the western states, Colorado was a little bit different from uh, the governors. So when the order for incarceration came for Japanese Americans on the west coast, some Japanese Americans had the chance to flee ahead of that deadline for when they had to go to the incarceration camps. So they chose to move inland. Now when this started to happen, governors from all over the west said, not in my state, they're not coming here. If they come here, they're going to have a problem. Well, Governor Ralph Carr, the governor of Colorado at the time, was the only governor who opened his arms freely to Japanese Americans. He received death threats daily. He received complaints and calls all day long, but he chose to do what he called the democratic and the American thing, which was to accept Japanese Americans. In fact, I just read a story that when he read about Executive Order 9066, he screamed. He said, how? How can we be doing this to our own citizens? And that was his attitude on everything. Now, Governor Ralph Carr actually did this 
And it, it shot his political career down because at the next election cycle, when everyone got a chance to vote, they voted him right out because they were so upset with him. Now, if you haven't already seen it, there is a documentary. It is, again, here's my second reference, on this additional resources sheet. Right down here, you can access this documentary for free on Rocky Mountain PBS's website. It's called Before They Take Us Away, and it tells the story of the self-evacuees and what they did to make it wherever they could. Here is some local press coverage from the area as these self-evacuees were coming to Colorado. We have a headline, Colorado Jap population up 30%, over 400 on the move and inbound. They inflated the numbers across the state and made it sound as though thousands and thousands of Japanese Americans were coming, when in reality it was only a few hundred that made it to Colorado in general. And most of them settled in Greeley. Now, um, this is a Lions Club, um, just a little informational in the Louisville Times, um, that talks about how the Lions Club did not, they sent a letter to their district headquarters because they didn't want Japanese Americans to come to their state, so they sent a letter of protest and they had received a response. But this right here takes the cake. This is from the Colorado transcript, which is out of Golden. And I just wanted to read for you some of the language. Somebody started off this idea of what to do with the enemy aliens that we, that we have coming to Colorado. What are we supposed to do? Their idea to them was not just Christian mercy, but common sense and good business. He said, keep them as prisoners, and we will use them to exchange for our American boys abroad. He wanted to put them on 10,000 acres of land in a place, it's a valley in the middle of nowhere, which the soil, according to this person's account, is poor land, sandy, rough, under irrigation, but with many dry spots and some seepy places. Few white people have been able to make a go of it in this area, but he wanted to put the Japanese Americans to work. And he said, put 10,000 Jap families on this land, give them some labor for a shack, a cow, pig, seed, and chickens. Tell them so long as they stay in this valley, no harm will come to them. But if caught off the reservation, they will be shot or thrown into the bullpen. This was Colorado at the time. In Louisville, the picture is a tiny bit different. The 1940 census has us at about 2,000 citizens. Out of those 2,000 citizens, 161 of those were Italian Americans born in Italy. 128 of those were naturalized citizens. 22 were still aliens, not having initiated the citizenship process. Six had first papers, which if you're familiar with the time, that just means they had started the paperwork to get their citizenship. And five were four. What does that mean? <laughs> so uh, when the census enumerator couldn't figure out someone's citizenship based on the facts collected, they would put four, which just meant unknown. Foreign born, but unknown on their status. In terms of German Americans, we had 20 born in Germany, one naturalized, one alien, and three, four. I still can't get over that as a phrase. Now, the Japanese Americans in the area, they actually didn't live in Louisville. They lived just north of Louisville today at what would be located at um, 287 and Isabel Road, kind of near Lafayette. I looked through the Lafayette census, I looked through the Louisville census, I couldn't really find much. But we do have some names of, of prominent Japanese American families in the area, the Takemotos, Yamamotos, Onimotos, and the Miyasakis. They, like I said, they lived north of Louisville, and this is a picture of the Takemotos in the 1920s. So they had come here to start farming the land. Um, here's an advertisement for the sale of their tomatoes. Noboro Takemoto was the son of the, uh, the farmers, and he would drive the tomatoes into town to sell them to the Jayco grocery store, which is where the museum is currently located. <laughs> um, now, the reason I talk about the, the Japanese Americans in the area is because even though they lived north of Louisville, they were able to choose where they went to high school, and the two choices were Lafayette High School and Louisville High School. Lafayette, in terms of demographics at the time, was much more white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and for some reason or another, I think all of, I want to say nearly all of the kids chose to come to Louisville High School, and they came from 1938 until 1953, I want to say is when the last one graduated. And then the family moved to California after that. But what does it say about Louisville that they all chose to come to Louisville High School? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> So this is uh, Betty Takamoto from the class of 1938. At a time when the rest of the state was already getting up in arms about Japanese Americans, calling them enemy aliens, Betty actually wrote the class will for the class of 1938. She wrote on behalf of her fellow students, saying that if the freshmen hear what we have done, they will know who we are. Um, she was also secretary and treasurer for her junior and senior class. That's a picture of the, the yearbook, by the way, at Louisville High School because they were the pirates was called the cargo. 
Here are some more yearbook excerpts. My favorite one is the class prophecy for Mary Miyasaki. It says Mary Miyasaki will be a reporter for the New York Times. Not only is she senior reporter, but she is also the star, candid camera woman. And this is from the class of 1942. Fusaya Yamamoto, her class poem from 1943 is, Fusaya is our little girl whose hair is always in a curl. Her personality, we do declare, is one that is so very square. And this was very normal. All the kids had poems and prophecies like this. So this just kind of shows how integral these kids were to the population. And, and when you get to read more of these yearbooks, you can see that they weren't kept out. They weren't separate. Maybe they had a little trouble sometimes getting to a few events because they lived out of town. But for the most part, they were included in a lot of things. Now this is Morio Takamoto, or Modi is his nickname to the class. He actually helped compo compose the class's preamble for their yearbook. His class poem is Modi was the country boy who came from Dogpatch Way, but when it came to baseball, he showed them how to play. His class will is he wills his sincerity and faithfulness to Helen, June, and Harley. If you guard these traits as Modi does, you'll be sure to succeed. There was another one that I didn't include, and I cannot for the life of me remember why I didn't include it, but um, there was a class will where somebody left their ability to chew gum without getting caught to the next person. So these are people who were just regular kids in the part of the class. Wartime service. We have a little bit of a distinction here where the, the, per, the, the not purveyant, that's not a word, where the rampant racism of America during this time does show up in Louisville. So we have Italian and German service members who are the descendants of people who are either naturalized or their parents are those aliens, and they are able to serve. So, and not only are they able to serve, but Michael Negri from the class of 1940 from Louisville High School, his wartime service was actually commemorated in the Louisville Times. And these are the headlines that came up when he graduated from Ariel Gunner School and was getting ready to hand it to the enemy, and then when he was awarded after the war for his service. Now, Michael Negri's father was an immigrant from Italy, born abroad and naturalized. He served in an unsegregated unit. The Biella boys, they also served. Um, the Biella family is the one that owned the Rex Theater for a very long time. So their, their Italian parents who were naturalized citizens were business owners in Louisville. Um, Albert Biella was made instructor at the Navy School in Boulder and that was featured as a Louisville Times headline on December 17th, 1942. And his brother Arnold Biella, both of them were featured in a World War II memorial book that was published in the early 1950s. And so it just shows you that their service was characterized as being one of the boys. They're two Italian boys, they served normally, they served with everybody else. There were so many more people that I could have included, Herb Steinbaugh, you name it, that were of German and Italian ancestry whose parents may have been naturalized citizens or aliens who were able to serve in, in not segregated, what's the opposite, integrated units. That wasn't the case for everybody else. So Jack Miyasaki, I talked about him a little bit before. Um, he actually faced an issue when going to register for the draft in 1942 while he was still in high school. He wasn't allowed to because they told him that he was an enemy alien. If you recall, his family had had their property taken from them, and so they actually turned him away. But what's crazy is later he went back again and they allowed him to because the need for manpower was there. So again, is that designation as enemy alien truly necessary, or is it just something we throw out the window when we need more bodies? Next, we have, again, Morio Takemoto, and that's his relative, Yugi Takemoto, from the Louisville High School class of 1943. They both served in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which was the all Japanese or all Nisei um, segregated unit during World War II. The 442nd saw the most bloody fighting. It is the only it is the unit in the in the American military that has the most awards given to it for the size of it and for the length of its service. That doesn't always mean good things. That's because usually they saw the worst fighting. Um, if you were here during Marge's talk, she said that was because their commander was white and he hated their guts, so he was willing to put them in harm's way very, very often. The unit's, um, lo not logo, their motto was actually go for broke. They just, that was because they knew there was no chance, so they might as well give it their all. And that was the 442nd. So we have these boys that went to high school with all of their friends in Louisville who were able to serve in regular integrated units, who got to get their, their awards published in the Louisville Times, but here we have, they have to serve in a segregated unit. Now after the war's end, let's talk about ongoing treatment, or during the war and toward its end. There was some hope. 
In the Louisville Times, when there was an amendment for, uh, that was going up in front of the Colorado legislature, they were going to vote as to whether or not to allow enemy aliens, not enemy aliens, but aliens in general, which could belong to enemy alien groups, to own property again. And they published this advertisement in the Louisville Times in 1944 to say you should not allow that amendment to go through because if you do, it will take away aliens' rights to own property. So they were calling the amendment uh, undemocratic, un-American, un and it fostered discrimination and racial hatred. They wanted to keep Colorado American and they wanted to allow aliens to purchase property. This is what really gets my goat. <laughs> so. Um, after the war, you see a lot of advertisements um, that talk about how we have confiscated all of these things, all these properties, all of these patents that belonged to enemy aliens, and now we're selling them back to the American public. They didn't even give them back. Remember I talked about the two different, if you had a child who was a citizen, maybe you could get things back, but if you couldn't, this is what happened to them. So in a simple advertisement about rubber, it says over 300 patents dealing with rubber chemistry are among the 45,000 United States patents that were seized from aliens and nationals of occupied countries, which are now available for licensing to American citizens. And this was in the Louisville Times. This is a local newspaper. Next, this is a story taken out of the Louisville Times as well, but it talked about a man who worked out of New York, James E. Markham. He was what was called an alien property custodian. And what his job was is to, I'll read it word for word because I find it funny, sell patent licenses, operate farms, forests, camps, apartment houses, $69 million film company. He's a detective, corporation operator, wine dealer, rent collector, custodian, collector of royalties, diplomat, and has taken over household possessions and personal properties of aliens in the U.S. It was his job to take alien properties and get rid of them as quickly as possible for the best price possible. And that was his whole job after the war, because this is 1946. Now, the reason that we talk about these things is because we still don't have a good idea of what should be done after the fact. Now, I tried to look up a lot of people who were designated as enemy aliens in Louisville, and guess what I found out? The National, what is it called? The National Archives. They actually have a page on their website that says, if you're looking for records of enemy aliens, they were originally transferred onto microfilm and then they were burned because in the archives they ran out of room. They were not considered to be important enough to keep. And these are just the records of the, it makes you wonder if there's something else going on there. But this is the legacy we have for ourselves that even today in 2024, we can't access these records to learn more about these people. So this is something that is constantly being talked about. It's very important to what's going on today. The fifth column threat is actually is in newspaper headlines today if you ever look it up. So this is very relevant to what's going on. But that's all I have for you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. My, there was like the Lafayette Forest and there was this place called Tanaka Farms. Mm -hmm. and they were started by Japanese American family. Mm -hmm. And my mom and dad, you know, shopped a lot at Tanaka Farms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of businesses. Even in Brighton, where I live, there's a Sakata farm. So it's, there's a legacy all over. Yeah. From, yes. Does anybody have anything else? Yes. Wasn't there also uh, a fighter, uh, a group of uh, fighters that were uh, Japanese Americans that uh, accumulated an, an incredible record of bravery and, uh, and success uh, fighting in Europe and escorting yes. bombers and, and so forth. Are you talking about the 442nd? Like, a, or is there another, there's another unit that paired with the 442nd? Is that who you're talking I, about? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I, don't remember. I will say um, during the war, a lot of members of the 442nd were given distinguished service crosses and, and Bill Okubo's father is one of them. Um, and they were actually assessed later to, as having earned the Medal of Honor. So they, ha they had done the deeds, they had bravely performed, but it was assessed that they needed to be given so what they were due. The 442nd was fighter aircraft? I don't know, I, I have to look that up. No, yeah, infantry. infantry. They combined with the, um, uh, the 100th Battalion. Of That's the one I was thinking about, yeah.
then the mainland guys were very, you know, mainland American um, culture. My, my parents were from West Coast. My dad grew up in Washington, and my mom was from California. So um, they were both in camp during the war, too. So. But yeah, it was kind of a culture class in that regiment. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think there's a story about the 442nd that they were tasked with rescuing the lost battalion. As in, they were tasked with rescuing the lost battalion, which was essentially a battalion of soldiers from Texas, white soldiers, and they were surrounded on all sides. And uh, they actually lost more men rescuing the lost battalion than were in the lost battalion. And that was just par for the course. Yes, you had a question? I'm different from Bill because his family was Mm-hmm. Whereas I'm, I'm a native Colorado, mm-hmm. so our family got to stay mm-hmm. because of Governor Carr and stuff. So our, my dad and his uncles all joined the army. We even mm-hmm. fought in World War II or the Korean War. And, yeah. And we didn't have a lot of, even when I grew up, there wasn't as much prejudice or anything like that as, mm-hmm. as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's really interesting that um, while there's all of these references to like derogatory terms about Japanese people, uh, like, but they're mostly referring to overseas, and then we have those about when self-evacuees were coming to Colorado, people were still willing to, they differentiate themselves and sign up to serve. That's, it's so, it's just cool, yeah. Yes? I'm, I'm curious because you mentioned this a lot of, about the naturalized citizens, mm-hmm. like so-and-so weren't naturalized. Yeah. So I don't know if you can answer this, but why weren't they naturalized? Was there a law policy preventing them mm. from being naturalized? I mean, I know no. all the Chinese-Americans are. Yeah. Them, but I love that question. Thank you. I, I may, and I probably should have clarified a lot better, too. So at least from the start of immigration, with the general trends, starting with Germans. They arrived very early, a lot of them arrived very early, and they had a tendency to get started on their citizenship very quickly. With Italian Americans, a lot of them arrived not so quick. (laughs) As an Italian, I can say this. Um, And then Japanese Americans, not as many people arrived, but what's interesting is a lot of them didn't apply for citizenship right away. It's just a trend, I have no explanation for why. I think it may be because when some Japanese went home to study, which was a trend amongst some people, I think they were afraid that they wouldn't be able to go back and study if they got their American citizenship or vice versa. So um, I don't have an exact reason why, but it's just some people didn't do it. Just, uh, and especially with Italians and Germans, it's kind of like what everyone around you is doing. So if everyone's getting their citizenship, you probably would too. So. Yeah, I don't have a why, but I have a trend. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Does anybody have anything else? Oh my gosh. Did the um, German and Italian families suffer the same loss of property? Some. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I said, the, the Italian fishermen on the west coast, uh, a lot of them lost their boats. Yeah. And then some of those 10 to 20,000 that were forcibly removed from either coast, since they couldn't take everybody out, on, at least on the east coast, those people who were forced to move, they lost their stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Is that it? Yeah. I'm just curious, yeah. you showed that Dr. Seuss fifth column. Mm-hmm. What year or what, when was that? I was 1942. So that was um, Pearl Harbor. It happened December 1941. And I don't know exactly the month, but that was the year that a lot of people were being incarcerated, forced to move, you name it. So perhaps it was even before the incarceration, you know, just the idea of a threat and what we need to quote unquote do to take care of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. There's, in my mind, sort of a par- parallel to social media. Mm-hmm. It's gotten more lax than it used to be. Mm-hmm. So, you know, social media companies used to try to police things, and now yeah. it's just a free for all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Complete bullshit on social media. Mm-hmm. And that's why these things, as as much as it seems like it's from the 1940s, it's very relevant to everything yeah, that's going on. Again, but mm-hmm. Look at some of the trends that are going on. Oh yeah. It's scary. Mm-hmm. It's pretty frightening. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So. You mentioned they they were relocated, not only Japanese, but Italians. Where did they put them? 
Some of them, here I'll go back to the map. This is the places where they went. So some of these were isolation centers. Some of them were what they called relocation centers, which were the incarceration camps. We do have evidence of um, there were some Japanese American incarceration camps where you have like Germans and Italians in there with them. I don't know where the, everybody went, but I know that they were mostly intermingled. Some who were held for internment, which was holding for the exchange with other countries, they actually stayed on military bases throughout the U.S. So there's like some who were in Fort Sill, you name it. Yeah. Yeah. Were any of them exchanged? You know, I think they were. What's interesting is um, the U.S. went down to Latin America. I say the U.S. like the country picked up and moved to Latin America. They sent agents to Latin America to round up Japanese Latin Americans and bring them back here for exchange, and I know that they were repatriated. I'm sure that they repatriated some, but I, don't, I didn't check those records before this talk, but that will be my homework. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But again, it's for political power. It's to make sure that your people over there are okay. I'm not saying it's justified, but I think that they felt justified when it was happening, which is ridiculous. I don't. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, same, that's why I called it mutually assured destruction, because it, it is like a failed logic, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, I appreciate everyone's questions, but also discussion, because that makes it fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming tonight. If you have any questions, I'll hang out for a few minutes. I recommend for the third time <laughs> that you pick up your additional resources. <laughs> On the way out, grab yourself a copy of the newsletter. Thank you so much for coming, everybody.